Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate everybody uh, taking time out. I know it's a lunch break and some people had to scarf down food to get in here or, or whatnot. So uh, yeah, thank you for, for coming in for this. A um, couple of things. Uh, I wanted to just say that, uh, first of all, uh, I had a hard time naming this presentation and I, I don't really like this title. So if anybody has any suggestions after you hear this material, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, this is uh, this is one of the, the shorter lunch talks. It's only uh, like 20, 25 minutes or so. So uh, what we're going to he have here is uh, just a high level of uh, um, of what I want to say about this topic. Uh, I've got a lot more material uh, that that's deeper, and uh, I even have some uh, some practice interactive exercises. I just can't squeeze them in here. So uh, um, after this talk, anywhere else during the the, uh, the, the conference or even tonight, the Hacker's Garden, uh, I'm more than willing to, uh, to talk about this. And if you happen to be people who really like coding tests during interviews, we can even debate it too. So uh, I'm, I'm down for all that conversation. But <clears throat> we're limited on time, so let's go ahead and, and just uh, uh, dive right in. Um, the first thing I want to say is I hate interview te or coding tests during interviews. I hate them, I hate them, I hate them. And uh, I want you to know that it's not a spontaneous kind of hate that just popped into me, uh, just like out of the blue. This is a really well thought out, deep rooted, passionate hate. I am talking about the kind of hate that could potentially cause me some emotional scarring at some point in time. I really hate them because they don't do uh, uh, what they're supposed to do most of the time. Um, they, uh, the idea is they're supposed to let uh, only the qualified uh, developers and the qualified engineers into our organization, but I've seen way too many uh, instances where there's, there's an extremely ca talented candidate who doesn't get in. So I thought about it and uh, wanted to come up with uh, some reasons why and what can be done about it. So um, a little bit about my background. Uh, I have easily been in more than uh, 100 interviews. And that's just on the candidate side of, of the interview table. Um, when we're talking about being the, the screener and, and interviewing candidates coming into my shop, it's been a lot more than that. I've worked in shops uh, that have insisted on uncoding exams, so I'm, I'm not coming uh, about this in a, uh, hey, I'm, I'm jaded because I got passed over when I tried to get into uh, to an exam. Um, I've actually been there where I've had to administer them myself. Um, I've also worked a lot with, uh, with various communities and user groups. So back in, uh, in my hometown of Austin, Texas, I'm involved in the Agile Austin users group and the Austin Cloud Ops group and the Austin DevOps group. I talk to a lot of my, my colleagues and friends there and I find out what are they doing back in their companies? How are they doing their Agile stuff? How are they doing this? We, we talk about hiring a lot too. And um, I hear what uh, other people's frustrations are. So there's a lot of perspective here. Now, what is the problem with, uh, with having just a little coding test? What's the problem with interviewing? The problem is not everyone can interview. It's a real skill. And uh, it's, it's not a skill that we train for. It's a skill that we're just told to do. Uh, nobody, um, nobody really gets a lot of training. Some companies are, are starting to, uh, to try to fix that and they're trying to train people to interview candidates, but it's just typically assumed uh, anybody can do it, so everybody is going to do it, and, and that's the way it is. Uh, it's kind of like saying anybody can sing karaoke. Anybody can go into the kitchen and, and create a gourmet meal. That's not the case. These, these are skills that, that you want to practice. These are skills that you want to have trained uh, and because they, they can affect people. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that happens when uh, you're not trained for, for conducting an interview is you tend to forget that they're stressful environments. 
Candidates are coming in to interview with your organization, and what are they looking at? They're looking at trying to convince a person or a group of people to make a decision that is going to affect their life. It's going to affect them financially. It's going to affect their, their families. Uh, it, it's, it's hard. Uh, it's, it's, who knows what, um, what uh, they are trying to do? And um, they don't know what to expect. You know, they're, they're people. They can't read our minds. They don't know uh, how we want to hear answers. They don't know if, if um, the, the interviewer is expecting a candidate to come in with really aggressive answers or if they're expecting the candidate to be laid back. They don't know how to respond. They don't know how to give those, those good answers to get them what they want. There's a lot of uncertainty there, which creates fear. Um, the other thing that we, we forget is that a lot of times people are coming in to interview for us and they already have a job. They are trying to squeeze time out of their, their normal activities to come in and see us. And yeah, granted, there are a lot of people out there who do not have a job that are looking for one when they come to an interview. But what are those candidates doing? Those candidates are not interviewing just at one place. They're looking at multiple shops. They're looking at, at multiple opportunities available for them. They, are, they should be considered just as busy as a regular, uh, regular candidate. So you, um, you get candidates to come in for two or three or four or five hour interviews, which seems to be the trend for about the last decade or so in our industry. And uh, it's hard for them to find the time and balance it against all their other needs. But what happens when you throw a coding project on there? Maybe if it's done on, on, the, um, on site at the, uh, during the interview, that might not be so bad. But what about um, a trend that we're seeing lately with the take-home assignments? Before you come in for the interview, we want you to code on this project. Some of them are pretty intensive. I've seen uh, in, in my time, I've seen co homework assignments for these interviews require as much as a week's worth of work. I once had uh, somebody tell me that they had a two-week um, uh, homework assignment that I was like, no, I don't want to have anything to do with that. But imagine that. You're working uh, and trying to find another job. You're already stressed with, with the time commitments and all your other uh, engagements. And then you're told, find another week's worth of time to, uh, to add in there. Are you going to, to do good work? Are you going to, uh, to make sure that everything is as thorough as possible? Will there, will be, there be um, some cutting of corners? What about your stress level at that point? That's got to affect things. So um, just logistically, it's not a nice thing to do to candidates. A lot of inexperienced interviewers forget that the interview is a two-way sell. The candidate isn't just there to say, I am the best person for you to hire. Hire me, nobody else. The other thing that they're there for is to interview you, the, 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 uh, the, the organization that they're trying to come into. They want to find out if this is a place that they want to work. So what kind of messages are you sending with these, uh, with these coding tests? The way I read it, the message comes about, we like to give inconsequential work in high-stressed environments for really, really ridiculous deadlines. And we want the, everything absolutely, positively, 100% correct the way that we would do it. Who wants to work in a shop like that? <laughs> yeah, look at this. I got two people to raise their hands, and I can tell by the look on their faces they were both smart asses. Okay? It's, it's not a good message to send. Now, I'm not going to argue that the interview coding test is not a powerful tool. It absolutely is a powerful tool. And I'm not going to, to argue that the best way to, uh, to see what somebody is capable of is having them actually do the thing. If, if I want to see just how good of a cook somebody is, I want them to make me a beef wellington. 
If, if I want to see just how good of a singer somebody is, I want them to sing me an aria. I'm not going to argue that fact. It is a powerful tool. But here is the problem with tools. You must use them the correct way. And when you've got a powerful tool that is in the hands of an untrained person, that can do damage. That can do serious damage. Now, in, in our case, uh, for, for what we're talking about today, what's that damage going to be? That damage is going to be the shop is going to lose out on a really potential, uh, pow- potentially a powerful candidate for them, somebody who could really elevate them and take them to the next level. That candidate who's getting unfairly passed on could be missing out on a great opportunity or a paycheck or the ability to support their family. The, there are real consequences to this. So what can you do? Well, my biggest message to you today is if you're going to, uh, to implement coding tests as part of your practices, don't do it. Simply just don't do it. There, there are a lot of other ways that you can go and talk to an engineer, talk to a developer, and find out whether or not they are, are capable and, and talented with, uh, with the technology. So uh, one thing you can do is discuss. Just don't quiz it. Uh, talk about it. Um, if I've got a developer coming in and I want to find out if they are a great Java developer, I can talk to them about Java. So tell me, what is your favorite version of Java? In the last version of Java, what was something that, uh, that really, um, really, really impressed you? What was something that you were able to use? What did you absolutely hate? Sure, they can iterate some of uh, the questions and reflect them back to you, maybe through book knowledge. But there is a follow-up question that can really, um, really trip them up if they are trying to snowball you. And are you ready for this powerful question? Ready? Why? Why did that last feature bother you? Why did it trip you up? How works too. Um, so I'm, I'm going to admit, I have not been a solid Java developer for, uh, for a long time. So uh, I remember interviewing somebody and using the same technique a long time ago. It was Java 1.5. And we talked about auto-boxing. And uh, I was like, oh, you know, auto-boxing is one of my more favorite features. Um, do you know what it is? Candidate told me. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Well, why would you use it? How would you use it? When will you use it? These are, are things that, that are, are situational and uh, can lead to a discussion. And I argue that uh, having the conversation about the technology interacting with them, exploring the technology with them is going to give you a much better sense of, of their ability to, uh, to use the technology rather than just putting them through a high stress exercise. Um, you know, another thing you can do is you can ask the candidate to provide some artifacts. So uh, nowadays, nowadays what, what do we have out there that, that is incredibly awesome? Open source. People are, are doing open source projects left and right. Now, I'll tell you from my personal can, uh, viewpoint, if I'm hiring a developer, I would love to see them do some open source work. Um, part of it is because uh, I want to know, are they, are they really involved in the technology? How much do they truly enjoy it? Do they enjoy it just enough to get the job done during the day? Or are they thinking about things later on? Are they, are they constantly working and mulling these problems over in their head? These are things you don't get out of a coding test. You can ask them for uh, uh, one of their, their open source repositories. And look at this. You can see when files went in. You can look at what their comments were like. You can see uh, the, the history of this whole project. Uh, you can see how they, they collaborated with people. How many people were they collaborating with? Do you get this information from, from a quick 30 minute test over uh, in your office? On a whiteboard? No. 
You don't get to follow the history of the code and, and see, well, what is their, their style? Do they, do they commit early? Do they commit often? Are they very verbose with what they're, they're describing? You know, um, nowadays, we work in teams. We have a lot of agile methodologies that, that guide us. We have DevOps methodologies. Uh, we have um, a lot of collaboration out there. And, and these things all place emphasis on the team. So how is your, your developer going to work? Solo or alone? Or, or on, on a team? More likely, they're going to be working on a team. Test those abilities. Those are going to be more important than, than their abilities to, uh, to actually write and remember syntax on the spot. Uh, you can ask them for a GitHub profile. And you get tons of information out of this. Again, you can see what they're interested in. You can see uh, the, the actual kinds of projects and languages that they work in. Uh, so you get a little bit more breadth of, um, of what this developer is as a whole. You can, um, you can see with uh, little charts like down here at the bottom, just how frequently the, the developer checks in code and how, how, are, how often are they working. You can get a lot more information about how they code rather than just can they do it. What about asking them for a Stack Overflow profile? Oh yeah, this is, this is absolutely great because what does this do? Well, first of all, look at the questions that they answered. You can see where they feel that they are experts in. You can look at the questions that they've asked over time. What do they feel that they need help in, or what have they actually enc uh, encountered that shows that they, they need um, some help in? Look at the quality of the answers coming back and forth. You can see uh, whether or not this is a candidate that wants to, uh, to work in a team or that has the ability to work in a team. How well are they going to, uh, to explain problems and new technologies? How are they going to bring their expertise to the table and help your organization grow and raise that bar? You're not going to get that out of a coding test in an interview. You can also make sure that you don't ask for code. Give it. So uh, here are some techniques that I've used. I've uh, gone into uh, to my own shop's source code repository, and I've picked out a couple of, of classes or files. And uh, I look for things that, that are interesting and, and um, can, can facilitate a discussion. So if it happens to be uh, an online interview, I'll share my screen. If it's, um, if it's a face-to-face -face interview, I'll bring over my laptop or I'll make a, a printout of the source code and ask questions. So here on line 32, what's happening there? Can you tell me? Can you tell me why you think I might have uh, used a, a for loop or a do loop down here in, in, uh, in this method? Get them to think about it. But here's the, the, the thing. Um, whether you're showing them your code, you're Googling for some sample code, or even if you've taken some time and written up a, an interview application uh, that you could show them, you're testing their ability to read code. How important is that? Can any of you in this room write code without reading it? when you're talking about bringing this person on board and starting in your shop, when they get there day one, okay, Greenfield Development, just go and write some code. Uh, that's, that's all we want you to do. You're just going to write code. Or are you more likely to have a legacy body of code that you want them to learn? Make them read it. Make them demonstrate to you that they, they have that ability because reading the code is as important, if not more important, than actually writing it. So, um, finally, uh, sometimes you just can't avoid the coding test. Lots of reasons. It might be political. It might be that somebody uh, well above your pay grade has said, thou shalt co uh, have a coding test. Whatever the reason is, if you can't do it, there are ways that you can mitigate some of these problems. So I want to be sure that if you have to give the coding test, please make sure there are no right 
or wrong answers. There is no right or wrong way to write our code. Now, granted, there are better ways to write code, and there are worse ways to write code. But more often than not, we can code up to the same solution and arrive at the same place, starting from the same place, and go two different routes. We can do it in different languages. We have different methodologies in our head. Some people are doing top-down programming. Others are doing object-oriented. They're, they're bringing what they know to the table. They're under the, uh, the gun for getting a solution out really quick in a high-stressed environment. Don't penalize them for being right or wrong. Just get the code out there. And the reason for it is because it should be nothing more than the basis of a conversation. When, when, you, they, when you see their code, ask them about it. Why did you make this decision? Why did you decide to structure your code this way? Why did you outlay the, uh, the, uh, the object hierarchy this way? Please tell me what your, your, your thinking, your rationale was. You'll get to deeper information. And you'll also be able to, to pull out a lot of extras. A uh, quick little side note, or um, example. I once interviewed at a place, and I was asked to, uh, to write a, a week-long um, homework assignment. So I did, and brought it in. Now, I purposely did not put a single line of inline documentation in that code. I gave a ton of unit tests. And I did this for two reasons. First of all, I hate inline documentation. I think unit tests are much better documentation. They live with the code, and I can guarantee at any given point that those unit tests are right just by running them. But I also heard that uh, this organization uh, had 0% code coverage. And one of their, their biggest goals for that year was to raise that code coverage. So I wanted to, to demonstrate to them uh, my ability to write the unit test, really force them to look at it, and uh, assert, if you don't have any, any code coverage right now at the unit test level, maybe I can show you a couple of other reasons why you want that. I was passed on the, uh, the gig, and I was told a week later from the recruiter, yeah, they didn't like your code because you didn't have any comments in it. We didn't have a chance to talk about the reasons why I made those decisions, which were done very purposely. Next, no one should ever be the sole evaluator of the code. First of all, you're gonna give that person a, a major god complex. Huge power trip, don't do that. But you also submit yourself to, uh, to the point where one person's opinion can be, uh, can be a make it or break it. One person having a bad day uh, could, could cause your company to lose out on a great candidate. So uh, make sure that it's always a group of people uh, looking at the code so that um, the discussion becomes a little bit richer at that point and you get more opinions to be sure that you're not just blasting uh, a candidate out of the water for no reason or for the wrong reasons. And along those lines, if it is at all possible, do not look at the code at all until the candidate is in front of you. So there, there are lots of different ways that coding uh, exams happen. And uh, one of um, the more popular ways is uh, we're going to give you uh, uh, the coding exam before you come in or afterwards. And um, we just want you to do it at home and email us the code or upload it to GitHub or put it to uh, some place where we can get to it. That's fine. Make sure you have it and be organized for, for the interview. Make sure you're, you're organized for the code review. But treat it as a code review. One of the reasons for this is because uh, you, you want to look at that, that message. First of all, it's, it's important that you're, you're looking at the code objectively when you do it. And having that, that first look is, is going to probably be the most objective that you are in looking at the code base. But uh, remember, it's a two-way cell. So um, make sure that uh, between these two last two points, uh, you are trying to show the candidate how you do things in your shop. If, if your shop has a, a policy where code reviews are only done by one person, and they can be critical, and they can blow your work out of the water, and they don't have to talk to you about it, then I guess none of these solutions work. But I'm willing to bet that since everybody here 
is at great comp and you're demonstrating that you are, are competent developers, that, you are, um, that you're passionate about software uh, craft, that that's not the way you do things. So please be sure that, that uh, this code review of, of candidates reflects the way that you do that. Send the, the right positive message. Uh, so that brings me to the end of this. It looks like I'm hitting this right on time uh, to get you out of here and on to the next session. Um, again, this was just a quick talk, so I went over all of the concepts that I've got at a very, very, very high level. Uh, we can talk about this in the halls or during the Hackers Garden tonight or tomorrow. I'm here for the rest of the conference. I'm actually in Copenhagen for the rest of the weekend, and I would love to talk to you about this. Um, I can share some, uh, some interview uh, exercises that, that I've got for, for hiring developers if this is um, of interest to you. But uh, with that, uh, we're definitely out of time, so I thank you very much.